This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to uh, Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, with Ian Leslie, who has uh, written a bunch of uh, fantastic books. Um, most recent book is this one called Conflicted, How Productive Disagreements Lead to Better Outcomes. And, and I found this to be kind of a logical outgrowth from uh, your previous book, which is called um, Curious, The Desire to Know and Why Your Future Depends on It. And there's another wonderful book out there, which is called Born Liars, Why We Can't Live Without Deceit. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Gregory. Nice to be here. Now, I mentioned that I thought conflicted really flowed from from curious. Uh, and in, in many ways, it's really about how, you know, curiosity about other people's points of view is essential if we are to have kind of productive uh, conversations. But but I want to just start with this whole notion of, of curiosity, because I think it's kind of a a prerequisite for the, these productive uh, conversations. And, you know, you kind of explore sort of the, the, the why of curiosity, the how of curiosity, the what of, of curiosity. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, curiosity has sort of had a, um, I don't know, a rocky history and that, you know, during many periods of history, uh, curiosity was sort of seen as, as a dangerous thing. Right. And we've gotten warnings about it. So St. Augustine famously was uh, very wary of, of, of a certain type of curiosity. Right. We know we have Pandora right, as a, as a warning, you know, don't open that box. And of course we all say that, you know, curiosity kills the cat. Okay. So, um, so, you know, why is it that, that curiosity has gotten a, a bad rap? And, and I think, you know, why is it in, in today's world, we at least, um, we at least praise curiosity uh, in, in theory, even if we don't encourage it in, in practice. Well, th there is a tension between curiosity and, uh, for want of a better word, uh, authoritarianism. Um, if if people want you want society want the society in which they're in charge of. <clears throat> to uh, they want <laughs> oh dear me sorry I'll start again <laughs> no worries <clears throat> um yeah so w when there's a, a a tension between the way that the people who are in charge of the society want everyone to think and and what people do think or might think then you you see that the the, the value of of uh, curiosity becomes negative right um. If you are, if you're in a society where you want people to think the same thing, you don't want people to ask questions, right? Because asking questions is at, at best a waste of energy, um, and at worst, you undermining the official narrative of the society, right? Um, there's a great uh, quote from the 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 writer Vladimir Nabokov. He said, "Curiosity is the purest form of insubordination." Right, there is something mm -hmm. insubordinate. There's something inherently rebellious about saying. So why is that, and and why does it have to be that way, and 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 you know, the, the reason that church elders in in Catholic uh, Europe in the kind of mid Middle Ages were not keen on curiosity and and warned against it um, was that they saw it leading the way to, to heresy one way or the other. You know, you start asking questions and you don't know where it's going to go. Could end up with a reformation. <laughs> um, so um, there was a, you know, there was a, a, a reason for that. And, and you see that still today in any authoritarian society, um, people are penalized um, one way or another for asking questions. You see it even in... Uh, Within organizations, within certain kind of um, mm. firms, companies, you know, or institutions, um, there are questions that you're not supposed to ask. And um, that there are cultures which kind of look down on people who ask curious questions and, and those that celebrate them. Um, and so, yeah, I think we have got much better at celebrating the value of curiosity as a society um, these days because we've got 
you know, we're kind of a post-enlightenment society, post-democracy society. We've got more used to the idea that everybody should think for themselves and, and have the right to question and reach their own conclusions. But I think underlying that, there is still a kind of unease with it um, in practice. So I think we kind of have a slightly kind of um, uh, conflicted relationship with it. Right. So while some, we may still have some authoritarian organizations and authoritarian kind of families, right, where, you know, the paterfamilias might tell their children, you know, do it because I say so <laughs> and, and discourage uh, curiosity and so forth. But but even in, in more kind of, um, I don't know, we might call it tolerant or, or liberal organizations, families and societies, th there's this, I think, belief that, that curiosity is, is off, in many ways a distraction, right? It's kind of, you know, more heat than light, right? If you uh, want to be efficient, and efficiency is, is something, you know, we all value to some degree, then, you know, you got to focus on the job, right? And if you're spending all your time kind of wondering, you know, why am I doing this? Or, you know, how can I do this better? Then you may wind up kind of failing to accomplish the job. And, and I think, you know, I think you, you, you point out that this is, this is legitimate and, and valid to some degree that there is a, a trade-off. And one of the things that I liked about both of your books is that you, you, you always, focus on the trade-offs, right? And mm. that there are these, you know, kind of sweet spots, not, not only in terms of, you know, what gives rise to, to things like curiosity, but also kind of in, in the application. And so, so one of the distinctions you make is between kind of this, um, uh, you know, di diverse of curiosity and, and kind of epistemic uh, curiosity. And, and I think that, you know, the former is probably more likely to be uh, a, d a distraction or, or potentially, you know, run into uh, harmful consequences. Could, could you talk a bit about, about the, the distinction, right? Are there different types of, of curiosity? Yeah. So it's been looked at from different perspectives and points of view by psychologists and, and others, um, over the years. Um, and there are kind of lots of different theories of, of how it works. It's, it's a slightly kind of, um, uh, confusing topic for psychologists actually, because they, as a discipline, you know, they tend to divide between the people who study the brain neuroscientists or cognitive scientists and people who study emotions mm -hmm. and, the, um, and curiosity just sort of cuts across all those devices. Mm -hmm. Um, it's cognitive and it's emotional at the same time. And it's also a kind of instinct or drive. Um, so the literature on it is, is interestingly kind of all over the place in, 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 in every sense. Um, but, um, there are two kind of principal types of, I'm simplifying slightly here, but there are two principal types of curiosity. One of them is this hunger for new information. So you see something mm -hmm. that, that kind of instinctively makes you go, oh, why is that? What is that? I want to know more. Um, you know, that, that happens every time that, that you, uh, you open an email because you, you're interested in the subject heading, right? This is diversive curiosity. So diversive curiosity is this hunger for the, for, for the novel, for the new, um, for the, oh, what's that? Let me see. Um, and it kind of gets you off the beaten path. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking about, those diversive curiosity will kind of pull you off it. And it's an instinct. It kind of, it's um, something you kind of feel almost against your will or, you know, it's, um, it's involuntary. And this, this, this would be just kind of like, oh, wow, look at that. You know, I'm get you get the, so for people who are just continuously scrolling on their, on their iPhone, looking for like the next, uh, like video, right. That would be, it's a form of curiosity, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the internet, social media in particular, they're, they're great kind of machines for stimulating diversive curiosity. They're constantly trying to drag your attention over here by making you curious. Right. Um, and the way they do that is by giving you a little bit of information, but not all of it. So they'll say, you know, right. So, um, you'll, so you'll see a, you'll see a header that will say something like, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the internet blows up over X. And then yeah. you know, you're yeah. like, what is it? And then you want to click on it, right? Yeah. So Taylor Swift went to a party and you'll never guess what happened next. Right? So, so you, you get a little bit of information, but not all the information. And that opens up, psychologists sometimes, sometimes call it a curiosity gap or an information gap, right? And in that gap is where your diversive curiosity takes you. You go charging into that gap. 
right? So, so you don't, you're not curious about things you don't know anything about. This is a kind of a mm -hmm. deceptively simple but powerful principle, right? You need a bit of mm -hmm. information, in order, but, but to the extent where you get curious. So if you've got no information, you're not curious about it. If you've got all the information about a topic, you're not curious about it. Mm -hmm. If you've got some of the information, but you know you don't have all of it, you go, oh, I need to know. So, so that's how diversive curiosity works. Now, if all curiosity worked that way, then curiosity, I would not be writing a book saying, you need to be, you know, you need to cultivate your curiosity because you wouldn't need to cultivate it, it would just happen. And also it wouldn't be that fulfilling. You're just kind of constantly clicking or shine, you know, chasing after the shiny new thing and never really kind of settling on anything. If we think about the people that we admire uh, that have achieved lots that we, we think of as deeply curious people, you know, great scientists, um, great innovators, great artists, um, they're, they're not just stimulate, you know, they're not just having their diverse of curiosity stimulated. They are building knowledge about particular field or, or particular fields um, uh, over time. Um, and that kind of deeper, long lasting curiosity, more long lasting curiosity is epistemic curiosity. It's about building knowledge over time, right? And that requires actual mm -hmm. effort and concentration and focus. It's, it's, it's not involuntary. It doesn't mm -hmm. just happen to you. It's something you have to decide to do. You think, I'm really interested in this. I'm going to learn more. I mean, perhaps you're doing it because you love learning more. It's not like, you know, it has to be a chore. Um, but but whatever it takes, mm. it, it is something that requires effort and application and focus. So so epistemic curiosity is really what happens when diversity of curiosity grows up, right? If it's allowed to grow up. It's like, okay, diversity of curiosity, you've stimulated my interest with this diversity of curiosity. But now can I translate that into epistemic curiosity where I'm actually starting to to build out my knowledge around that area? Yeah, it's interesting you, you, you dig into this idea of effort because on the one hand, um, the, the effort required for epistemic curiosity you know, discourages some people from uh, digging into it, right? Because people are essentially effort conservation machines. But, but you also mentioned that kind of the, the more effort you, you apply, kind of the more satisfying uh, the, the curiosity is. And, and you, you highlight how you know, Google kind of makes it you know, a lot easier to um, kind of obtain a fact. And so we, we kind, of, kind of skip over the part of, about trying to figure it out ourselves. Me, me I, I always like to try to figure it out first. And then, you know, last resort, go to, go to Google, right? And, and that seems kind of inefficient. When you can get the answer kind of very quickly, why would anybody, you know, uh, expend this unnecessary effort? But I think for epistemically curious people, they, they view this process of trying to figure things out or, you know, what you call kind of puzzles, um, as, as almost like a sport or as a, um, you know, pleasurable activity. So, so, you know, how much do, do we need to, you know, construct for ourselves a, 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 a path to knowledge that has an optimal amount of, of effort? How do we manage that, that effort? And what do we do about, you know, people who don't find the joy, <laughs> you know, in the effort piece? Well, I mean, those are two big questions. Um, I, I, I think that, that, you know, the, the reason I wrote the book, really, or, or at least the argument that the book makes, the kind of mission of, of, of the book, if you like, mm -hmm. is to cultivate your epistemic curiosity, recognize its value. Mm -hmm. um, because actually... You don't need to cultivate it after a certain stage. You know, we're born curious. Mm -hmm. I go into this in some length in the book, you know, curiosity in childhood. We, we kind of have this biological engine of curiosity, um, which we've evolved uh, because we are cultural creatures. We need to learn out. We need to, you know, the way we survive is is not just by surviving in our biological niches, but in our cultural niche. We, not, we need to work out what these mm -hmm. adults are up to and why they talk this way and why they behave this way um, in order to, to, to get on in the world. Now, once we've done that, our curiosity naturally wanes, right? So as we get become older children and then adults, we kind of figure out how to be in this world. And, um, uh, you know, perhaps in, as adults, you know, we get the credentials we need in order to, to get a job and then we learn how to do our job. And then, oh, 
well, you know, there's no point in me kind of really being curious anymore because I kind of figured out how, how this machine works and it's, it's working quite fine. Now, I, I think that's the danger, right? Because actually you do need curiosity much more than you realize perhaps. And, and, and you do need to, to put the effort in over time. It's not just going to happen to you. It's not just a gift that, that keeps on giving. Um, epistemic curiosity is something you have to cultivate. How you do that, I mean, that's kind of lots of th stuff to say about that, but I'll just say one or two things. Um, w one of them is, uh, you know, choose one or two subjects. It might be work-related, it might be completely not work-related or, or both, um, where you already kind of know a bit more than the average person and then really go deep on those as deep as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, 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 the sort of secret of, of happiness as 18th century aristocrat said is, um, to know one or two things very well and know a little about everything else. Can I put it a little bit more elegantly? Well, this is that. the fox I mean, hog, right? It, that you, and I, yes, yes, I, it's sort I, of, I yeah. was amazed. I, I couldn't believe that it took me this long to, to actually hear, this word fox hog, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think some people in, in the business literature refer to it as kind of a T shaped uh, individual. Right. But, yeah. but um, you know, the fox hog term, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to steal that and I'm going to use that, you know, a lot going forward. Cause I love it. Yeah. So, so there's the kind of um, story of the hedgehog and, and, and the fox. And the idea is that the hedgehog, um, uh, the, the, the fox knows many different ways to, to, to survive. Um, and, and the hedgehog knows just one, right? You put the spikes out when, when you're under attack and that's all you need to know. Um, and that's this is sometimes used as a kind of, um, a lens through which to view different historical figures, different politicians uh, is, is, are they a hedgehog or are they a fox? You know, are they somebody who's very clever and knows lots of stuff or are they just somebody who focuses on one thing and is really good at it? I so Reagan versus would be a would be a hedgehog. Clinton would be a fox. You know, you get the idea. Now, I I, I use it in the book to in a slightly different sense, which is to say, you know, you need to be a fox hawk in the sense that you need to know really deeply about one or two things, mm. and then you need to know a little about everything else, so you understand how everything connects and everything joins up. Um, and that's and that's the kind of the the structure of your own knowledge that you should be you should be looking for well one of the points that you make is this idea that kind of knowledge uh feeds curiosity right um in other words the, the more as you start acquiring knowledge it makes you uh, more curious about uh the edges right and acquiring additional uh, knowledge in other words it's it's not i think a lot of people have this view that okay you, you're curious, you want to know something, and then once you know it, then that gap has been closed and the desire has been satisfied, the hunger has been uh, eliminated, and then you revert back to, to baseline. And I think you're making this point that, that, that knowledge is kind of the, the, the fertilizer for, for curiosity. And that, that, has a, that view um, has very different implications for you know, how you structure education, right? Yeah, so um, th there's a kind of naive view of curiosity um, that you often hear. Uh, you hear it from kind of tech people who do TED Talks about curiosity and, and education, which is, unfortunately, is a kind of quite a popular kind of uh, mm. uh, view of education, which I think is kind of completely misguided. Um, and, it, and it's something like this. You don't need to fill kids' heads with knowledge, with facts. You know, teaching shouldn't be mm -hmm. about imparting information to, to children. You should just let the children's curiosity run free. Particularly now they have access to, to the internet. They don't actually need mm -hmm. to imbibe um, information and they certainly don't need you to, to, to give it to them. They'll work anything out they need for themselves. Now this is, just sort of misguided for, for a few different reasons. But, but one of them is it's fundamentally misunderstands the nature of curiosity. Um, knowledge does not kind of crowd curiosity out. Knowledge is a stimulus to, to, for, for, for curiosity and for creativity. Um, if, you, if you think back to what I was saying about the information gap, you know, we're not really curious about things we don't know anything about. Um, we become curious when we have some knowledge about something, we realize we don't have it all. 
So uh, knowledge is really kind of kind of fuels uh, curiosity. The 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 more I you know, if I know a little bit about the French Revolution, I'm going to be a lot more curious about it than if it's just meaningless to me, right? Um, tell me a story about the French Revolution. Give me some interesting facts, or tell me something dramatic about it. And I'll go, oh, really? I want to know more. Give me a bit more information uh, in the right way, and suddenly I'll want to know more. And then it'll kind of keep on. So you know who understands this really well, this principle, is storytellers. So storytellers mm -hmm. know instinctively that the way to, to create interest and, and drama and intrigue and curiosity in the reader or the watcher, the viewer, is to give them a little bit of information, but not too much. Right. So, so if you're watching or you're reading the opening of a, a, a of a novel, or you're watching the opening half an hour of a, a of a movie, mm -hmm. they're, they're giving you, they're trying to give you just the right amount amount of information, you, leave you kind of confused mm -hmm. and mystified, and after a few minutes, and you will be, well, I don't want to watch this anymore. I just, just don't understand what's going on. Letting you know how this is right. all going to unfold, and you be, oh, I'm not interested in this. Giving you a little bit of information about the relationships or the story, and then saying, okay, but now you want to know this. And that's the way education works is, is you know, you, you, you're kind of giving kids knowledge, which stimulates them to learn, to learn more knowledge. Right. So I think the idea that you just say, Hey, kids, you don't need knowledge. You don't need facts. You don't need information. You just go out there and learn whatever you want to do. It's just actually a recipe for, for, for incuriosity and, and, and essentially for sort of gi mm -hmm. giving up. So you have to kind of create this flow, I guess, right? This this ladder, which is not too difficult and not too too easy. I think you you had some fascinating uh, stuff in there about uh, how early this kicks in, right? And how babies, you know, we all know that if uh, a baby is exposed to more words, right, uh, as as a baby, that leads to you know changes uh, in how they communicate and so forth later in life. Um, but this this thing this this NFC, right? This need for cognition. Um, this is not something which is an inherent attribute, but is something that can be kind of shaped by the kind of caregiver interactions. Can, can you talk a bit about that? I, f I found that absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So the the, the scientists who, who who study this um, will will actually kind of study what's happening to to curiosity. Um, when in babies and then and then in uh, with child, older older children, um, and you'll see that that even at the kind of a very young age, um, babies will kind of respond to the behaviour of their caregiver. So if their if their mum or dad is kind of, for instance, just sort of pointing to things, then the baby will point to things more. Um, you know, and pointing to things is a way of asking a question before you can verbalize it, right? Um, and then there are kind of studies of of uh, households where uh, the, the the children kind of uh, grow up curious or, or in, in curious. Again, I'm kind of simplifying here. Um, and one of the kind of interesting insights from that was that the households where where the, where the children were really curious. Were, were not just the ones where the parents were answering their children's questions, mm -hmm. but the ones where the, the parents were asking questions of the children, right? So, so mm -hmm. the, the, the kid will ask a question and, and the adult won't just go, oh, well, the answer is, is uh, the Amazon River. Um, mm -hmm. They'll say, oh, I don't know. I think it's this, but um, what do you think? And, you know, how would we work it out? What would we need to know? And, 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 and they're kind of like, you know, help them but but not kind of mm -hmm. sometimes giving somebody the answer is a way of kind of shutting down their curiosity right and yeah. and and acknowledging that perhaps you know you don't know you're not sure how would we work this out is actually a better way to to manage that and and to to uh cultivate the, the child's curiosity right i think you mentioned that a child may ask forty thousand, you know whys uh, you know, before they're five years old, I know with, with my, my mother, uh, you know, I would never get shut down, but my mother would often kind of make stuff up just to, you know, make me more, even more curious. She just tell me all sorts of tall tales so that I would, I think, wait, that, that, that doesn't make sense. I need to, I need to dig into this a little further. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, um, but, but, you know, in terms of education, um, uh, you mentioned in the book that, on the one hand, while people who have this need for cognition, this curiosity are going to be increasingly in demand, 
we, we seem to be funneling people more into uh, kind of highly specialized roles, right? So, you know, I've, I've had a lot of conversations on this podcast about kind of specialists versus versus generalists. And, and it seems like, you know, specialists are often kind of, you know, rewarded more and, and uh, in, in certain disciplines. Uh, and so there's, there may be, you know, uh, excess demand for, 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 for more, more generalists. Would, would you say that this, this move towards kind of skill-based education where we can kind of, you know, track the, the competencies and so forth is, um, is a development that's a little bit worrisome, right? Because uh, it's, it's, you know, curiosity is not a skill that, that is easily, easily measured, I guess, in, in the same way that being able to code, right? The best coders, the best lawyers, these are people who aren't necessarily the ones who have the most testable knowledge, but the ones that have this, you know, hunger for, you know, for cognition and for figuring things out. Um, do we need to have a, a good solid, you know, metric for this capability before we can start, um, you know, pushing it more in the educational context? Well, you know, perhaps we do, but we don't have one. And, and, and the, the problem is, is that, uh, because we don't have one, um, people don't know how to value it properly. Right. We're just not very good mm -hmm. at valuing things that we can't measure increasingly. Um, right. And we tend to assume that the things we can measure are the, the important things, and that the things we can't measure are, must be unimportant, right? Which is just just doesn't doesn't make sense. But that's kind of the, the way we operate a, 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 a lot of the time, in particularly in the business world mm -hmm. and in in the academic world as well. Um, so yeah, I do think that, that specialization. Obviously, there are huge benefits to it. It's, specialization is one of the kind of drivers of economic growth right and 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 but yeah if you if you if you take this too far and uh everybody's rewarded for being an increasingly kind of deep specialist in one point and and you you don't value the kind of connections that people can make across different disciplines mm -hmm. different areas of knowledge then yeah you you really kind of um you've got a problem this is not just from a curiosity point of view but from a creativity point of view so, so one of the kind of valuable things about curiosity is that it takes you away from your specialization as well as kind of driving you deeper into it, mm. right? So it should operate at both levels at once, kind of vertically and, and laterally. Um, and often you, you'll find the most successful people in their field are, are the people who have a bit more breadth as well as depth. Um, obvious mm. example um, is Steve Jobs um, in terms of, you know, innovation or, or, or business, however you want to situate him. But he was somebody who brought together technical expertise. You know, he wasn't the the kind of the great technologist of, of, of Apple, but he had, you know, sufficient technical expertise to keep up with um with Steve Wozniak. Um and uh, and he brought that together with humanities, you know, he's very interested in 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 literature and and, and art and um counterculture and uh, music and you know he did a calligraphy course when he was a year it was just because he was interested in calligraphy and and later made sure that the the mac was installed with proper fonts which is why we now have fonts on you know microsoft word and you know everyone has classical fonts on, on their on their computers all because mm -hmm. he just decided to follow his curiosity at university um and so you know part of the point here is that y you don't actually know what's going to be valuable to whatever you're doing that you can you can take so, so insights and, and bits of knowledge and facts from uh, completely different fields that you've acquired just because you're interested in them can suddenly become valuable five ten twenty years down the line mm -hmm. um to to the your specialized subject um in a way that you can't really predict and you shouldn't really try to so um i i think there are both kind of straightforward reasons to have some breadth, which is, you know, you're going to be better at collaborating with other people from different fields mm -hmm. if you have, if you know a little bit about what they do and, and workplaces increasingly run on, on collaborative multidisciplinary teams. And then there is kind of a less straightforward, just, a, 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 but just as valuable point, which is, yeah, sometimes you, you're going to connect different bits of knowledge from different fields mm -hmm. and create something new, right? Which is the kind of essence of, of creativity. Well, you mentioned serendipity, and um, you say that maybe you know the 18th century was the uh, 
high point of, of serendipity, maybe. I mean, I remember when I was younger, uh, just spending an enormous amount of time in bookstores. And uh, you, you mentioned bookstores. I spent an enormous amount of time in, in, in the library. And, um, you know, this was an, an environment where y- you would just kind of stumble on something and, and, uh, and so forth. And, and a lot of people say that, you know, because we're not spending time in that environment, but rather in the, you know, internet environment, um, you would think that that environment would actually facilitate more serendipity, but some people will say that, you know, because of algorithms and because of, you know, echo chambers, uh, you're, you know, you're going to get, um, less serendipity, right? Um, you, you kind of just double down and descend through the rabbit hole and, uh, and these, these random encounters, I think a lot of the tech companies are trying to figure out how can you design an algorithm for, for, you know, for, for serendipity. Uh, and I've got students who are trying to create, you know, startups that would, um, facilitate kind of more serendipity within the, kind of the, the work environment so that, you know, when you go to a, a meetup or you go to a, a networking event, you don't just kind of, you know, see the same people you know, over and over again, but you have these, these, these random encounters. How, I mean, what, what's the relationship between, you know, serendipity and, and curiosity? How can we, design an environment or a life for ourselves with kind of the optimal amount of, of serendipity? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, serendipity is, it's about being prepared to be interested in what comes your way by accident mm-hmm. as much as it is putting yourself in the place where you know, accidents mm-hmm. might happen. Um, and, and again, we can come back to this question of, of breadth and kind of having a wide breadth of knowledge, mm-hmm. the, the wider that you, the, you know, the wider you cast your net effectively and the more mm-hmm. likely you are to pick up interesting, unexpected, um, points of view and, and, and insights and so on. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, that, that, quote from Louis Pasteur, which is chance favors the prepared mind, you know, so Mm -hmm. scientific serendipity is about being, being ready to spot when something is interesting, Mm -hmm. not just being, not just being there when something interesting happens. You might not notice it unless your mind is already prepared for it. And, and so cultivating a kind of broad and and rich range of interests means you're going to get more serendipity, more kind of good luck in that sense is going to come your way. Well, I'd also be interested in hearing you, you talk a bit about the role of kind of anxiety, uh, and, and also, um, you know, insecurity and and how those things can kind of shut down, uh, creativity, right? So, you know, if you're in a fight or flight mode and, and this is not just for kind of curiosity about the world, but it's also, I think about this third type of curiosity that you mentioned, which is kind of empathic curiosity, right? Curiosity about, about others, not just curiosity about the world, but curiosity about the, uh, you know, the human world and, and others. How does, um, you know, how does stress, anxiety and so forth um, affect our, our, our curiosity? Badly. The two, <laughs> the two great killers, the two great killers of uh, curiosity uh, uh, kind of uh, at opposite ends of a spectrum of our mm-hmm. fear and complacency mm-hmm. um, you can think about this in terms of a workplace right if, if you're in a workplace where it, everybody is very very anxious a, a, about how how well things are going everybody's very insecure about the company and about their own position mm-hmm. um then they are likely to be less curious right they're just likely to spend less time kind of chasing down their own rabbit holes and trying to work on their own projects. Mm -hmm. They're also less likely to ask questions of of others. Nobody wants to be seen to be, you know, anything less than all knowing and highly competent. So we kind of stop asking questions. And so, so, and, and this kind of fear of the boss and fear of of upsetting the boss. So, so fear kind of shuts down. Now let's look at the opposite kind of company almost where, where, you know, everything's going incredibly well. (laughs) They're making Mm -hmm. tons of money. Um, they've been doing it the same way for 20 years. It all works fine. Um, then th- 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 there's also danger that that company will become very incurious. Um, and then before they know it, they'll be disrupted by a, a smaller, hungrier c- company that's, that's more curious about 
consumers and about how technology is changing and so on. And mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, they eat their lunch. So, so there are kind of like these two, two opposite poles. Um, and so you're, you're trying to create this, um, again, as you say, you know, it's a trade-off. You're, you're trying to create this space in the middle where people are secure enough to ask questions, but also kind of, um, nervous enough not to kind of spend all their time asking aimless questions. Like, you know, there should become some sort of like, um, goal, um, there should be some sort of limit on, on what you're doing, but. Um, you, you're trying to like channel people towards this kind of productive right. um, curiosity. So, I mean, then it's possible, right? Because we talk about trade-offs, it's possible to be too curious. I mean, I, I know that when I was, you know, I, I, I never finished my PhD in part because I couldn't, you know, I kept switching disciplines and, and my advisor was like, you know, you got to stop reading. <laughs> if you're ever going to mount anything, you got to stop reading, right? Um, I mean, curiosity can, uh, mm. if not kill the cat, it can certainly kind of derail um, your, uh, your ability to kind of, you know, achieve your goals, right? I mean, um, do we need sort of a, 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 a counterpart book um, called, I don't know, uh, persistence, which is the, 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 the guide to anti-curiosity. Do we, do we, are there people that are in danger of having too much curiosity as much as there are people who are in danger of having too little? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you have to have, um, some, it has to have some relationship to, um, the goals that you're pursuing in your life, right? It's a kind of, but, 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 but uh, indirectly, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a good question because it's kind of, there isn't a clear answer to it. If we were only pursuing knowledge that was meeting goals directly, that wouldn't be really be pursuing curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. That would just be kind of following our orders or our, in, even our internal orders. Um, so there is inherently something kind of off the beaten path about curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's kind of acquiring knowledge and insights that you don't necessarily need to know. Um, but again, if you go all the way off the beaten path and you just lose sight of the path altogether, um, then you can find yourself lost and, and, and aimless and, and, and wandering. Um, so yeah, I, I think you, that that's a, just a balance to strike really. You're, 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 you're trying to go off the beaten path, but, but without losing sight of it and returning to it mm -hmm. now and again. Um, and that's the kind of secret of a, a, a happy kind of productive, curious life. So, so, in, so in the, in the book, um, in the book conflicted, right. You know, you're, you're really talking about how, uh, disagreement can be a, a source of, of knowledge and wisdom. And that, you know, in fact, disagreement is much more likely to promote knowledge than agreement. Right. I mean, if I think you quote, uh, William Wrigley, who said, you know, if I've got uh, two people in the room who agree, then you know, one of them is is unnecessary, right? Um, do, why is it that um, people are afraid of disagreement? Or why is it that they, you know, are, I don't know, fearful of or uh, aversive to, to disagreement? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, because it, it, it goes actually back to the root of the reason we were talking about curiosity being undervalued, right? Um, is that if you're if you're in a society where everybody is expected to agree with one another, right? Which is actually most societies up until the last few hundred years, right? So the idea that we all kind of sit around and have different points of view and we hash it, you know, we bash things out, relatively new and you know, it's an experiment. The jury's still out on, on, on this one. Um, I mm -hmm. like it this way, but, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, so for most of human history, we've been in societies where you're kind of expected to, to believe the same things as, as everyone else. That means there, there is a, a kind of negative value to curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also means there is a negative value to disagreement, to open disagreement. Yeah. Um, because why would you be, you know, disagreeing with people and arguing with people, you, you, you know, you, you just kind of take your opinions from, from, from authority and that's all you need to do and get on with your life. Um, and, and, and you can then take that right back to the roots of human societies. You know, if, if somebody was, um, 
we didn't really disagree with each other. We we, we just either kind of got mm-hmm. along with each other, or or if someone had a different point of view, they would just make a threat, and then you had to respond to the threat. Mm-hmm. Um, and today, when they do neuroscience experiments, fMRI experiments, and they put people in scanners and they kind of show them disagreeable statements or statements statements that disagree with a person's stated point of view, the bits of that on their brain light up are the same ones that are light up when they're you know being attacked by a bear. Yeah. Um, we still have this kind of deep rooted sense that when someone disagrees with us, what they really want to do is kill us or, you know, at least kind of bash us around the head with a club. Um, and it's very hard for us to, to get over that. Um, and no matter, you know, how kind of carefully we say, oh, we, we, we you know, we're going to disagree openly here. That's totally fine. And when, when somebody comes at you and says, no, no, no I don't agree. You, you always get that sense that, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck, uh-huh. you know, stand up a little bit because of that kind of evolutionary route. So I think we find it instinctively hard, instinctively aversive, um, but a little like what, you know, in the sense that we find curiosity hard because it takes up energy that we're trying to conserve. Disagreement is is hard, but it pays off. You know, the effort of engaging in it and, and overcoming your anxiety pays off in big ways, it essentially makes you smarter um, and, and, and more creative and actually improves your relationships, e- e- even when you think you're, you're damaging them. Um, so yeah, the mission of this book is just to say, you know, let's really get better at curiosity because nobody comes along and says, mm. sorry, curiosity, a disagreement, because nobody comes along right. and says, disagreement is hard. You've got to learn how to do it well. Mm. Um, we're just expected to know how to do it. And I don't think we're very good at it. And it's something that we have to give a bit more thought to if we're going to disagree well. Well, you, you point out that kind of uh, marriages, the most successful marriages are ones that have this kind of disagreement sweet spot, right? Where, you know, they, they have conflict, they have disagreement, they have kind of knocked down conversations. And you talk also about how, you know, people who are raised in households that have, you know, disagreement, um, turn out to be folks who can, can manage, interact with other people, you know, more successfully and, and so forth. So, you know, this, it's not just that people don't like disagreement, but it's kind of like disagreement has a, has a, has a bad, bad rap for, you know, relationships. I personally, if, you know, I can't think of any more pleasurable activity than to, you know, go on a hike with, with some good friends and, and, you know, get into it right? and start. And, and I, you know, if we do, if we do agree, I manufacture disagreement just to kind of keep things interesting. Um, wh- why, what, so, you know, tell us a bit about that. You know, why is, why does disagreement actually so- strengthen relationships? Uh, and does it have to be done, you know, do you have to, does it have to be done in a certain, certain way? Obviously, if people come to blows, that's not going to be very good for a relationship. Yeah, it definitely has to be done in a certain way. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, 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 we can talk about that. I mean, I, there's quite a few things to say about that. And that's part of, a big part of the book is, is about how to do it right. But, but to answer your first question, which is, you know, what, why is it important? Why, why, why is it good for relationships? Even though in the moment it feels like it's bad for the relationship. That's why, you know, one of the reasons we get anxious, yeah. we think, oh my God, I'm going to damage my relationship with this person. Or, um, and so we kind of shy away from it, which is a mistake most of the time. Um, but actually it's the other way around. There's a really fascinating line of research from um, psychologists who study couples. Um, mm-hmm. And for a long time in that field, there was a kind of base assumption, which was the couples that argue a lot are, are, are the ones that are going to split up. Because they've kind of been looking at mm-hmm. couples in hindsight and say, well, these couples kind of argued a lot and they split up, therefore. But actually, it doesn't work like that. The, 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 more recently, they've been changing their minds. They've been doing better experiments. Um, well, one of the things they do is is they'll get couples into a room um, and they'll put a camera in the room and then they'll walk out and, and, and they'll say, can you, can you argue about something that you argue about in your marriage? Like what a contentious issue in your marriage, your partnership, whatever it is. Um, we all have them, right? Um, whether it's, you know, who's, who's spending too much money or who's drinking too much or who's doing their share of the housework, whatever it is. And the couples really get into it <laughs> immediately. Um, or, or at least they, they behave quite naturally. They're kind of a, they don't worry about the camera too much. 
And then um, the psychologists will then kind of measure who was quickest, to, which couples were quickest to rise to argument, mm -hmm. how vigorously they engaged in argument and so on. And what they find, and then they track them, they track how these couples do it over the next six months, two years, five years. So these are longitudinal studies. And they found that the couples who were quicker to rise to argument and were more vigorous in their arguments were actually the ones who were more likely to stay together, mm. more likely to be fulfilled, and more likely to have solved some of the problems that, that they were um, arguing now, about. Now, this, they're, not, now this um, is, they're not bickering, right? They're actually kind of arguing. I mean, there's a, there's a difference, right, uh, between yeah. kind of pointless yeah. bickering and, and actually kind of constructive conversations, right? Yes. Although the, what I find fascinating about it is, 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 um, or one of the things I find fascinating about it is that they are, they are hot arguments though. They're, they're, they're not sitting around having kind of Socratic discussions about, <laughs> about, you know, what's going mm -hmm. on here. They're getting into it. Right. And they're, they're, they're having a bit of a body, right? So it's not bickering in the sense that it's not about nothing. They're, they're, they're arguing about the issue, but it is also quite emotional. And when I talked to one of the psychologists that, that runs these experiments, I said, so, so what, what, what do these, what, what is working here? What, what is the function of, mm -hmm. of these arguments in, in a couple's relationship? And she said, look, conflict is information. Mm -hmm. So, so in a, in a conflict, particularly if it's heated, you're actually learning about the other person or you should be right. if you're, you're kind of paying attention right you're learning about what they really care about uh -huh. uh, what they really think like once the veil of politeness which exists even in you know intimate relationships mm -hmm. drops or, or once the kind of veil of passivity drops you know we don't often we often just avoid these things if we can when you actually have the row and you have it out that phrase "have it out" is so sort of suggestive. You know, you're, you're seeing the inside of that person's mind and, the, and that person's heart, and emotion is part of that, right? Yeah. So, if it's too kind of rational, you might you might not see that, um, and that ultimately brings you closer. That's how, he, and that's because as a couple, you know, you, you're both evolving. You think you know each other really yeah. well, but under the surface, each of you is changing and moving. And now and again, you need an argument to kind of update your your model of of your partner. Um, and, um, so yeah, the, the, the couples that, the, that are good at doing that without really tearing a strip of each out of each other, right. It's being nasty to each other, being unpleasant to each other. That's never good, right. Nobody's kind of advising that, but having a kind of heated argument, that's, you know, that's good. So it's actually a bad idea to suppress one's emotions during these conversations. I mean, I've always tried to work hard on yeah. that and, and focus on the matter at hand and, and this, enrages and frustrates the people I'm, I'm conversing with, even though I, I'm thinking that this is the way to, you know, move the, the ball down the field, so to speak. Um, and you talk about how, you know, oftentimes the, this, the arguments are not about what the, what they seem to be about. And, and this is not just in marital relationships, but you also talk about in hostage negotiations and other kinds of right heated conversations. The, the conversations are, are, are almost never about the thing that, is being expressed, but there's, you know, subtexts and, and contexts and, and so forth. And the good conversationalists are the ones that are very, very attuned to that. But is, is there some, you know, benefit to, uh, I don't know, establishing kind of rules that would um, make context less relevant? There is. Um, I, I, let me just I mean, you put it very well, and I, I, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what you just said, which is, and because it's good to be aware of this this kind of basic truth, which is when in any conversation that there are two levels of communication going on, there is what you just called the matter at hand, right? Which is shorthand for that is the content level of of the conversation, and then there is the uh, the relationship level, which is mm -hmm. um, unspoken. Um, most of the time it's kind of, um, it's subterranean. It's, it's consists of kind of tone of voice and, and body language and, um, choice of words. Um, but it's not directly I expressed and that, that relationship level is about what you think about me. What I think about you, you know, am right. I, do you respect me? Do you, do you mm -hmm. like me? Are you, and, and often because two people or more people haven't got um haven't settled that relationship level mm -hmm. 
the the the, the content level kind of breaks down mm-hmm. because at least one of the, the 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 people is unhappy with the respect or whatever it is that they're getting from the other person, and without necessarily saying it directly, they'll kind of show that you know dissatisfaction in how they behave, um, and the the. the Perhaps unsurprisingly, because it conforms to stereotype, when they when they study this, they find that um, females tend to be more attuned to that relationship level than than males are, um, and and so often you, you know uh, you'll find in, in uh, an argument between a man and a woman, the woman is kind of concentrating on how she feels about the the relationship that is being expressed in that conversation. Mm-hmm. And the man is thinking, well, why can't she just talk about the thing that we're meant to be talking? Why is she being so rational? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and and not kind of noticing the relationship signals at all. What the really kind of funny kind of postscript to this, which is that um, when they there's variation in the uh, in, in these experiments, and they pay the man to pick up on relationship signals. <laughs> so she gave him a financial incentive <laughs> to say, right, can you tell me what's going on here? How is she feeling? And they can do it. Like, so it's not right. like, you know, that cliche that, oh, men just aren't wired for it. You know, men just aren't emotionally wired. No, that's nonsense. Men are, they just don't have as much incentive because they've culturally, you know, kind of dominant. <laughs> they don't feel like they have to. Um, so they just haven't developed that habit. Um, and And often you find that people who are, on the wrong side of a power imbalance in society, just generally in society, are more attuned to those relationship signals than the people who aren't. So they're kind of better at, at, at reading mm-hmm. people. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I, so I just think bearing those, those two levels in mind is just good in, in any kind of conversation. Uh, uh, have we settled that relationship level? Because if we haven't, that's probably why the content level isn't going so well. Sorry, now I've forgotten what your um, second question was. Oh, yeah, is a value in setting rules? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the value, one way of expressing the value of a good organizational culture um, so in a workplace, within, within a couple, mm-hmm. a couple has their own culture, right? I just, the culture mm-hmm. is just kind of word for the way, the habits of behavior and, and, and thought and, um, amongst a group of people. Um, a really good culture takes a lot of that relationship stuff out it it, it, it mm-hmm. kind of settles that relationship level if right. you're in a good culture where every it's you know everybody's expected to disagree openly therefore yeah. it's not a sign of disrespect it's not a sign of like oh i'm out to get your job or i don't like you or i think you're rubbish it's just the way we do things here then that immediately kind of takes that relationship tension off the table and that is the value of a good table, a good culture for, from a kind of productive conflict point of view, because then you can really mm-hmm. get into the content, the matter at hand, and and really have a productive, intelligent, insight generating uh, disagreement. Right. So in the, in the university programs that I'm associated with, right, you know, what we try to do is we try to tell everybody that as part of that program, you know, hey, look, you're part of this community. Um, you know, everybody here is you know, trustworthy, everybody here has your back. And, and so once that ground rule is established, then now you, you should be free to, you know, disagree without worrying uh, about threat. Uh, I found it, it's actually a little bit harder now. I, I, I think, you know, especially during, during COVID, I found that, and maybe it's just because of the general anxiety level, but it, it, it felt like, um, my students were less capable of engaging in these productive disagreements and they would, you know, retreat from the disagreements in person, maybe drive those disagreements online where they could be less, um, you know, difficult. Uh, and, and it took kind of a lot longer to, you know, get people to that place where they felt secure in the relationship and could have the, this productive, uh, disagreement. So how do you, um, I mean, is this, do you think this, I mean, I, I never like to talk about trends based on anecdotes, but is there, um, I think in, you know, in, 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 in the culture, uh, you know, in, in organizations, um, maybe is this more challenging? We, there are companies like Intel that talk about constructive disagreement, right? But I find that in a lot of companies now, disagreement is kind of pushed on, under the rug simply because th- there's this, this lack of, of, of trust in, in the community. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think that's undoubtedly true, right? And, and it's partly because we're seeing a lot of toxic, unpleasant arguments play out on, on in public, um, on social media, on TV, in our politics, and um, and so on. Um, and so, you know, if we were already a little bit uncomfortable with disagreement, um, now more than ever, we see that and we go, oh, no, I don't want any part of that, you know. The, the, the problem with a, with American society or British society is actually not that there's way too much disagreement. It's, it's, there's too little of it because we see mm. the kind of the worst of it, it and it's made very public and it's kind of amplified mm. and the rest of us go, oh, gosh, I don't want to go there, right? right? Um, so that's, that's, that's one reason. The second reason is um, we have put a, quite rightly, put a high value on diverse groups. Uh -huh right from people from different backgrounds right so so that means that you, you you're bringing people together with different beliefs different kind of um yeah different kind of outlooks on the world and you're expecting them to to disagree it's actually harder for everyone because everyone you know most people anyway are pretty kind of nervous about upsetting or offending other people. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in a more diverse group, that's more likely to, you know, people are more likely to be kind of a little bit backwards and coming forwards when they have a point of view or a, a difference of view. Um, and I think that's a great shame, right? Um, having a more diverse group around a table, well, you know, it's good from a social justice point of view, you would do it anyway, but there should be cognitive benefits to it too, mm -hmm. right? There should be a benefit of, of having people with different backgrounds and perspectives around a table, which is you bring all those perspectives together mm -hmm. and you create something is much more vibrant and much more insightful and much more interesting than it would be otherwise. And I think it's a great shame if we just, you know, you have all these people around a the table and they're all different and they all just nod along with each other. You know, you're not getting mm -hmm. the, you're not unlocking the, the, the benefits of diversity when you do that. Yeah. So I, I think kind of, doing what you've just been talking about and, and the few different ways to do it, but getting people more comfortable with disagreement, really helping them get over their anxiety about it and saying, this is fine in it, in this culture that we're creating here around this table, in this classroom, whatever it is, in this workplace, in, in, in this culture, we expect and we want disagreement. It's not a sign of disrespect. It's the opposite. When we disagree with each other, we're actually respecting mm -hmm. the other's point of view because we, we want to hear their disagreement with us and we want to have them out. That's how we make each other smarter. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it is a, it's a, a real problem. But, yeah, that's, that's partly why I, I wanted to write the book. Well, I mean, you introduced that you talk about this concept of kind of the division of epistemic labor. And, um, you know, I, I like this a lot, right? We know in kind of adversarial legal system, if you have uh, someone who's taken the, you know, point of view of the prosecutor and the other one who's taken the point of view of the, the defense attorney, you know, we, we think that you're more likely to get uh, the max amount of information out on the table and arrive at a better decision than if you have sort of a single person who is tasked with kind of, you know, figuring both sides out. Um, and, and you say that this is kind of the, the, the power of biased thinking. So um, we in business school, we spend a lot of time trying to de-bias people or unbias people. Uh, but maybe what we should be doing is, is kind of curating, you know, a, a Petri dish of, of, of biased people uh, and then kind of, you know, let them, let them have at it in, in a, in a curated environment. Um, is, do we, do we spend too much time thinking about debiasing people? I mean, is this, is this a, is this a fool's errand? Should we, you know, be focused more on, um, you know, constructing encounters that will, will enable the emergence of kind of truth in some way? Yeah, I think it's a good way to put it. I mean, wait, to, to be clear, we're not talking about, um, prejudice or we're kind of in the bigoted right, sense right. here, we, we, we're talking about, right. We, we, we're talking about um, biases like confirmation bias, mm -hmm. you know, biases towards or a, a, a particular perspective, um, clinging to your, your your kind of particular argument point. Of view. Now, yeah, so so when we tend to think of all those kinds of of bias as irrational things that mm -hmm. you know we should iron out and 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 kind of flaws to be got rid of. But I think. Um, we should show a little respect for evolution here. You know, there might be a reason that we 
uh, have evolved that way. Um, and what one very kind of plausible theory of why we have these biases is that it works better in a group situation where people have different points of view. Mm. You know, think about it. If if you're in a group situation, you, you, you get a kind of debate going and everybody kind of let's go of their point of view almost immediately because they hear one that they think is better or might be slightly better, then you wouldn't really be interrogating that topic for very no. long. And therefore, you wouldn't be unlocking the, the benefits of, of the disagreement. If people's points of view are a bit more sticky than that, if they're a bit less willing to back down, and actually if they're motivated, perhaps mm. for ego reasons, a little bit of ego, perhaps a little bit of my side bias, whatever, but whatever, they are actually motivated to think of more and better reasons for their point of view mm. and to knock down the reasons from the other side, to point out the weaknesses in their, their mm. arguments, then actually you can have a really much richer and more productive disagreement. Now, we talk about trade-offs all the way through this discussion. Yeah. People stick too hard to their point of view and they're completely inflexible and they don't listen to the other side. Obviously, that's a bad thing too. But there is a happy median here where people have are motivated to, to make the best case possible and to point out the flaws in the other side then actually you're going to get rid of a lot of bad arguments a lot more quickly than you would do otherwise. And you're going to get much closer to the truth and explore more more possible areas for the truth than, than, than you would otherwise. Right. And I think in that, that trade-off discussion, you, you don't use the term, but I think you're kind of implying, you know, this idea of strong opinions, you know, weekly held, which we hear about a lot in, in the business world, right? Yeah. You know, don't give up too easily, but, you know, don't, you know, refuse yeah. to give up right, your, 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 your point of view. And, and I, I think, you know, this, this idea of, of groupthink, we, we see it sometimes emerge even in, in scientific communities. You, you reference the kind of orthodoxy oh, yeah. around, around sugar, right. In the, in low fat diets and so forth. And, and, um, you know, I think a lot of people were concerned that the debate around kind of, uh, you know, COVID interventions and stuff had been a little bit too, you know, inhospitable to robust discussion. And, um, and so, you know, even in, in scientific communities, you can see this kind of group think, uh, emerge. Um, but, um, but I want to uh, sort of wrap up by, by asking you, right. You, you know, you talk about, you, you say that negotiating with terrorists is not that different from dealing with teenagers. <laughs> and, uh, that was my, my favorite quote, I yep. think of the whole, whole book. Um, but that in order to, um, really learn from disagreement, you have to put yourself where the other person's at, so to speak, right? You have to really learn to, to listen and, and inhabit their, their point of view. And, and this takes us back to curiosity, right? And it takes us back to that empathic curiosity that you, you mentioned in, in the curiosity book. Um, so if curiosity is a, is, a, is a discipline and a skill and, and productive disagreement is a discipline and a skill, is, is, the, is, this, uh, is this based on kind of, is empathic curiosity a, a skill that we can develop and, and does it develop from, in, only from interaction with humans or can it develop from interaction, say, with, with literature? Oh, I think it can develop um, in both ways. Um, Literature, uh, novels in particular, are, are are kind of great channels into other consciousness. Is I can't actually say that word, but into <laughs> other people's consciousness. <laughs> you, know, you, 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 the great value of a, of a novel is that they're very kind of um, interior. Not not all of them, but that's the kind of great kind of value of the form is you kind of seeing inside uh, other people's minds you're getting a very rich mm. picture of it um and it's no coincidence that the form kind of arose during a period of mass kind of urbanization um uh where you lots of different people are, and and being thrown together from 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 different places and suddenly it's like wow there's all these kind of different types of people around me and 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 the the novel kind of helps kind of bridge those gaps and, and 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 art and literature still still does that um uh, uh, but yeah emp empathic curiosity is is you know curiosity about the thoughts and the uh, feelings of, of other people and i do find it's kind of the um antidote to kind of really unpleasant bad conflicts um if you are disagreeing with somebody 
it, 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 let's say this is the person is really a, um, got a point of view you know you're never going to mm. agree with, right? And um, they just said something that you just you never going to. What's the point of arguing with them? Well, I think when you're in that situation, you can at least say to yourself, well, I can be interested in how they arrived yeah. at that point of view. I'm not going to try and argue them out of it. It's pretty it's pointless kind of, you know, contest. Um, but I can be interested in, in how they got there and in and in finding out about how they got there, um, I, I will be a little bit more aware of my own views mm -hmm. um, and also be a little bit better at arguing my case, actually, because, you know, you, you understand the other side's case. The better you understand that, the better you are at, at, at putting your own case. Um, I think there's a kind of inherent uh, sort of dichotomy between curiosity and judgment. Yeah, you know, we we can judge people, and we it's just instantly kind of like, well, that person's bad or that person's stupid. Therefore, I don't have to be curious about them or about what they're saying. And um, or you can be curious about them, going, why do they think that? And you have to kind of suspend judgment in order to do that. Um, that's some, you know, there's nothing wrong with judging people. Sometimes that's what, what what you have to do. But just recognize that you're choosing one or the other, and that sometimes mm -hmm. it's good to kind of push yourself. Um, back towards curiosity rather than just going straight to judgment, which is what we do a lot of the time. Um, if only, as you said right at the beginning of this conversation, to conserve energy, because we're all trying to conserve our, uh, our mental energy um, all the time. But, but um, sometimes that's uh, not actually helpful for our mental development. Well, Ian, uh, definitely uh, you inspired me to avoid uh, conserving my energy and to uh, read your work. It's really fantastic. This book, uh, Conflicted, it's really a, a great uh, guide to um, uh, interacting with other people and, uh, you know, improving your relationships with the folks at work and at home. And, you know, maybe if you're a leader creating an environment that is um, supportive of productive disagreement. And also this book, Curious, uh, I think it's really fantastic guide uh, to the phenomenon. And don't forget, uh, Born Liars back in the day. Thanks so much, Ian, for joining me. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.